Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of System Level Design. When you think about the most complex SOCs that are going out the door these days at 28 nanometers and 20 nanometers and even 40 nanometers, it's a wonder that they still work. And part of the reason they do work, a good part of the reason, is that they are verified very effectively. Verification traditionally has been 50 to 70 percent of the NRE that goes into designing these chips, and that hasn't changed, but the size of the chips and the complexity has grown significantly. So here to discuss what's going on in verification today, we have Janik Bergeron from Synopsys, Harry Foster from Entrographics, Pranav Ashar from Real Intent, Reich Brinkman from One Spin Solutions, and Tom Anderson from Brecker. So Janik, from your perspective, as we start getting much more complexity in a chip, what's changed from the verification side? I think the most significant uh, change that happened recently is the rapid adoption and acceptance of UVM. It's uh, in and of itself, UVM does not introduce a lot of new technology that did not exist before. What's important is its standardization and it becomes an important enabler for creating an ecosystem that helps us address the challenges that are of the increased complexity. Things like BIP, debugging tool, analysis tools, so it's, it's the next platform in which we can build the next levels of technology that will enable us to address the more complex designs of the future. Does it solve the differences of what existed between VMM and OVM in the past? It solves them by simply taking them both out of the equation. Of course, there are interoperability layers so that you can migrate your existing uh, environments and legacy IP that either in OVM or VMM into uh, UVM, but because UVM becomes the actual only methodology standard, it removes this, uh, it's the same way that System Verilog simply uh, removed the, the, the VHDL Verilog uh, dichotomy by having everything under a single umbrella. So what you've done is, to some extent, raise the level of abstraction of where verification is going by doing this, right? Correct. So instead of coding System Verilog, you, you you're not writing individual statements anymore. You're using class libraries and best practices and coding patterns for implementing functionalities at a higher level of abstraction, which allows tools like the debuggers or the verification IP to provide functionality at the same level. So you no longer single step through code, you single step through phases or transactions. So Harry, from your perspective, what's the big change that's happening in verification, particularly as we get into more complexity? So I, th I think a change has occurred, uh, certainly in the past 10 years, when we've moved to SOC class designs. Um, so we basically have three independent um, development and verification paths. We have the IP path, we have the SOC integration and system validation path, and then we have the software uh, development and, and validation path. The real challenge today actually is moved to the SOC integration and uh, system validation. The reason is, is that you just can't get enough simulation cycles with these very large designs. Um, so the industry is forced to move to emulation, FPGA prototyping, and you know, and other means to actually complete the ver verification tasks. In fact, you even see cases where um, uh, functional verification is not complete. It even goes on into post-silicon because they know they just can't get it all done in pre-silicon. So Pranav, from your perspective, what is the big change or big changes that have happened in verification in the past couple of years as we have rising complexity in a chip? So there's something that's actually been happening over the last decade, uh, and it's really uh, come to fore in the last couple of years. And, and, and this is that the nature of complexity, in my mind, it's, it's changed. Uh, it used to be that the complexity in verification was determined by the number of things that went into the chip. Uh, it's now increasingly being determined by uh, more than what goes into, uh, or the number of things that go into the chip by what goes into the chip. Uh, and a great example of this is, uh, uh, is the asynchronous interfaces that are uh, uh, basically all over the place on a chip today. Uh, uh, the typical SOC is a collection of a large number of uh, diverse components, uh, and all of these uh, are these diverse components that talk to each other uh, are through mostly asynchronous interfaces. Uh, and the verification of asynchronous interfaces is at the intersection of uh, functionality and timing. Uh, and, and, uh, 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 and because of that, 
um, a functional simulation by itself and static timing analysis by itself are not able to address this uh, other verification problem. So, so this is a fundamental change uh, in in the verification complexity. So, Reich, when you think about verification and and chips are getting much more complex than the, what they were in the past, what's changed there? How do we deal with some of this? Uh, the challenges uh, keep the chips functioning and accurate and working, and what do you have to do that's different than in the past? So one thing is um, that we move from uh, our verification up to the system level. Uh, we also uh, have integrated formal in many ways, and I think today formal is not an option anymore. It's a must-have. Uh, there are several places where formal is doing a much better job than any other technology. For uh, example, for X-checking or for register verification, these are automated solutions that you can apply to any of your SOC design, and it's just doing a much better job than any other thing you can you can try there. Formal's been talked about though for a very long time, and the ability of system designers to really think in terms of do we understand formal, do we understand assertions, has never been obvious. It's it's always been one step removed from where they think. How do they? take advantage of this better than what was done in the past? Well, as I said, it's uh, mainly by automation. Um, it's uh, assertions that are created for you instead of writing them yourself. That's giving you a lot of benefit and a lot of uh, power in uh, your verification that is, um, hasn't been there for, for a while. Um, in many companies, these solutions have been um, developed and uh, put into place. Uh, but now there are standardized um, flows and standardized approaches, and uh, that's when uh, everybody can benefit from these uh, things. And it's bringing you closer to the goal of uh, verifying more and more of your functionality with assertions. So when you think about uh, from a 60,000 foot level, where is formal used versus some of the other tools that are out there? Where would you use formal that you wouldn't use something else? What would be the advantage? So on the, on the design level, um, clearly uh, you can weed out a lot of um, issues with advanced um, uh, linting or uh, structural assertion synthesis, no matter how you call it, where um, you basically look at the RTL, you don't write a test bench, you just uh, throw in whatever RTL you have very early in the design cycle as a designer and weed out your uh, brain dead bugs uh, that you put into the RTL uh, just uh, by a push of a button. That's something where you should really look at. Um, then at the verification level, verification engineers use verification IP to check um, if whether the blocks they get uh, really comply to the specification. On that level, it's highly automated. There's lots of verification IP available. You plug it in and you run it and you see, uh, you can read out uh, protocol errors pretty easily using that. And then even on the SOC integration level, there's applications like SOC connectivity or X verification where you literally also just push a button. Assertions are created for you and um, you're gonna find bugs, uh, surely. So Tom, from your perspective, we've got much more complexity than what we've had in the past on SOCs. How do we deal with that? What happens in verification that has to change that, that wasn't there before, maybe going back a couple of nodes ago? So I think I see three things in the functional verification space that are changing and I do believe have to change. One is that people are discovering that a pure test bench approach is not sufficient when you're trying to verify the whole SOC together. So UVM is great as far as it goes, it uh, works great on IP, but it really doesn't scale to the full chip level. I'm disappointed about that a bit because I was one of the people that worked on UVM, but in fact, the customers are clearly telling us it's not a full chip solution. So people are then realizing the second stage is they do need to take advantage of the embedded processors that are within the SOCs to help verify the SOCs from the inside out. After all, if the SOC is doing its job in the final application, it's the embedded processors that are in charge. And so it just makes sense to leverage the power of those embedded processors as part of the verification process. So customers that have gotten past the first stage are writing C-tests or diagnostics, perhaps would be a better word, in simulation, in emulation, running on the embedded processor SOCs to try to verify the, the chips. The third phase, which is where we come in, is to say, okay, if you believe that, now let us automate those C-tests for you. And so that's sort of the culmination of where Brecker comes in and helps the process, is to say, Verify from the inside out. Don't just try to do a minimal level verification with your test bench. And in fact, we can even automate that process for you in very much the same way as UVM and constrained random verification automated test bench process. We can automate the process of C testing inside the SOCs. So are we getting to the point where we're more comfortable with the functionality of 
these complex chips, will they be more reliable than in the past, or are we just barely keeping up? I think it depends upon which customers you talk to, but certainly we do hear from some that are just barely keeping up, whereas people used to perhaps budget one tape out uh, or maybe one uh, tape uh, turn, two tape outs, one, one chip turn in the process. Uh, often we're seeing people are now budgeting as part of their planning for three to four to five turns of the silicon. Uh, that's, that's really tough to do with the cost of these deep submicron mass sets and, and the time lost in the market to actually do each of those fabrications. So I think the problem is getting worse. I think there are customers that are recognizing that and are very open to new approaches. And it's not only just what's going on on the silicon now, right? It's also as you're almost field testing the software as it comes out and saying, okay, if this thing doesn't work, we'll, we'll repair it as we go forward. That, for sure. Certainly people do often think that if there's a problem in the hardware, they can fix it in the software. Certainly, we strongly advocate running the final software on the, the hardware prototype, either RTL or emulation or, or FPGA prototyping. Uh, the problem is that doesn't really verify the hardware very well. That just makes sure that that particular pair works together, that, that particular set of system software and that particular hardware implementation works. If you're doing something like, like an iPhone or a tablet where customers and end users of all kind, hundreds of companies come along and write di very different software applications to run on that platform, Unless you do a really good job of verifying the hardware, some of those folks are going to stumble across lingering hardware bugs that you didn't happen to hit with your particular system software. So I think that this open programming model that all these consumer devices have now, starting to look like a traditional computer, means that you can no longer just verify your software with your hardware and figure if there's a bug, you can fix it in your software because it's the customer software, the end user software, the third party application software that gets in the mix as well.